I'm Ed, and uh, I've been involved with the, the continuum since the early 2000s, and I, I apparently bought the first one. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe the second one. Yeah, and uh, it, it, it's, it's been um, uh, a really great part of my life to be involved in this instrument. Um, it's, uh, it's rare that you find um, that you can form a relationship with someone that have you have completely complementary skill sets, and uh, so we, you know it's been, as Lippold says, it's beneficial for uh, to find me. I actually think it's been more beneficial for me to find him, because uh, uh, my m mind, while I really enjoy mathematics and computers, um, I'm, I really go on a need to know basis. So. If if I don't really need to understand how what those biquad filters are actually doing, I just like to know what they sound like and how I can control them. So the whole aspect of the um, Egan matrix, which is the the synthesizer that resides inside the um, the shark inside the continuum, um, is just a came out of um, a need for us to. Um, make a, a, a synthesizer that was dedicated to the performance techniques for the continuum. Originally, it was working a lot with Kima, and Kima is a very flexible, uh, if you don't know it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a language and uh, there's associated hardware with it. It's really always been based on having dedicated DSP, um, and there's been a few iterations of hardware, but, but essentially the language has been slowly expanding, and it's a very, very flexible world to live in, and it's one of those worlds where uh, I don't know anyone who masters it. It's you dive into particular subsets of it. And it was a very nice, mer because uh, Lippold knows uh, the people at Symbolic Sound who make uh, Kima, uh, there was a, a very uh, intimate relationship uh, between the continuum and um, Kima. And it originally worked over uh, Firewire, and it continues to work with the newer models over MIDI. Uh, and so w after I got my continuum and I had been a long time user of Kima, I started to adapt some of the things that I knew from Kima and designing um, uh, sounds in Kima that was specifically worked for the continuum. And uh, also at the same time I got involved with Lippold and, I, and found that um, he was very open to uh, my suggestions uh, for Im trying to improve the instrument, certain things that we wanted to achieve. Um, uh, initially, most of them uh, mechanically related, um, and and the the c continuum is a really refined product now. It's it's been I mean it's the sort of things that Lippold's talking about the bars going in, and getting the surface to stay in place, and the type of surface that we have. We've just thought about that thing. It's a real Renaissance instrument now, and but now we have this digital world that we're continuing to explore and you know and expand out on. Uh, there was certain math that I learned to use in Kima that um, I was always going to. Um, and so when I was designing sounds for them, I found certain structures and things that I was always repeating. And it, it seemed to work well within trying to play this particular instrument with a um, digital synthesizer. Um, and if there's one thing, what the continuum was, as we started to try to market the continuum uh, more uh, aggressively, um, we were realizing that, um, I, I kind of knew this too, but uh, the, we, the type of people that were buying it, you know, most people, they buy synthesizers, a uh, majority of them don't really dive into the programming, and even fewer majority dive into the deep programming. Um, and so the only synthesizer that really worked well with it was Kima. And Kima is a daunting thing to get into for people. And it's, it's really hard for people that are uh, mathematical to re fundamentally understand how the, you know, a mathematical language can be daunting when you see things that are very simple. Like a simple summation thing just befuddles people. So. So, you know, so you, what we were doing is, w as we would set up people and we'd recommend Kima and people would get into Kima, that you would have this instrument that requires dedication to play. I don't say it's hard to play, it just requires dedication. Time, it's, you know, your money is the smallest part of what your experience with the continuum is. The, mo the most important part is the time you're going to spend with it. 
And the other part is going into Kima. So it was a double whammy of how do you design sounds for it? Like I have to be a designer in Kima and also work with the con continuum. So we said, okay, let's take, uh, and at the same time, Lippold was discovering this shark and, and realizing that what used to take this entire processor to, to do, now the shark is taking circa 3% of, of this chip to completely scan this surface, you know, every uh, third of a millisecond and give him all the data that he needs. And he has this 97% that the engineer in him says, well, we <laughs> got to utilize this. This is a shame to nature that we're not using, uh, utilizing that power. So we decided to make the engine. Originally, it was going to be a simple sine wave generator. I don't know if you remember this before. We were a sine wave generator that when you're in your hotel room, you have something to practice before you hook it up on your synthesizers. Oh, and I'm sorry, and I'll back step to say why Kima was um, a, a the really the only synthesizer. Is this was way before there was even a consortium to introduce something like MPE, which makes it easier for these expressive controllers to talk to it. This way before that even became language. So, but the type of things that MPE is doing now is what uh, Lippold was doing with Kima, you know, back in the early 2000s. So, so there wasn't any other choices for people to, to use the instrument. So we, so we made this um, synthesizer and we started to come up with structures for it. And, um, and it sort of just all sprang from there. And we took the core ideas that I had developed in Kima and incorporated them into what works with the Ega matrix. So, um, and then from there we've expanded it and tried to be very careful that when we expand the math in a particular way, we solve problems um, that we don't create this kind of uh, bifurcated way of doing things. We don't create you know, multiple ways to get around the same problem. You want to make you know, the solution as, as, as simple as we can. So in, in some ways we've been very slow to expand um, the interface, but in other concepts you could say, well, we've actually been very good at expanding it. And you can, uh, in fact, if you have any of the um, continuums with a shark processor in them, you can still utilize them and use the exact same software that uh, front end that we're using for it. So in terms of what is a, uh, the longevity uh, component of your purchase, <coughs> that's very important to both Lippold and myself, that this instrument is not abandoned. Uh, there's design philosophy about, about it that um, uh, we want to see this thing live past our lifetimes and, you know, ha and basically have a growth and you know, inspire other people. So, you know, as Lippold sometimes refers to when we're dead and gone, which is always a morbid <laughs> subject to me, I think, I don't, know why, I don't even want to think about that, but it's there. So this is, um, this is the, the graphical front end for the Ega matrix. The Continuum Editor runs Mac PC. Normally when you uh, open it up, you'll see it like this. Um, if you get into the programming aspect of it, you expand it out to see the matrix down there. But it's not necessary to um, uh, look at the matrix uh, at initially. Um, and in fact, you can sort of customize the sounds that are internal in the um, in the Ega matrix and save them as your own type of um, uh, type of uh, group. So uh, what you can do is go into the library here and pick any something from any of these categories that we've put in, and then click again and, and see any of these particular sounds and it will load it up and there is a number of different performance aspects to the sound that are available here within this link and also here and if you make changes to let's say in this particular sound the body type and the uh, the amount of body resonance and if you like that an easy way to sort of save that is just shift click into these user presets there's 16 slots very useful if you're going to do a performance set and um, uh, you want to customize. So without even really getting it, this is sort of the upper level of synthesizer design where you, you, know, you have some macro controls, overall brightness, whatever it is, and you've modified them and you want to change 
those controls for a particular part that you're at and as uh, in, in performance. And then as you adjust them, you can save the same sound and then very easily go back and forth through using the interface or using something like the Kenton controller to do that. So that's at the <coughs> very basic level that you can do things like reverse the keyboard, which is weird, uh, transpose the entire surface. Although at Lippold, uh, we had a particular situation with Benedict, um, who's going to do, I'm sure, an amazing pro uh, uh, performance on, on Saturday. And he had this particular structure that did we didn't have implemented. And then I mentioned to him today about the idea we had of reversing the keyboard, and he thought it was completely logical. If we thought it was completely <laughs> stupid <laughs> and ugly, and I only mentioned it to him as a joke, but yeah. Actually, that originated at a trade show where we were playing on one side of the table, and then the people on the other side of the table wanted to play, and rather than have them come around the table, we just reverse it, since it's symmetric around the center. It, it yeah, the idea was you could demo a sound, and then just uh, hit the reverse. And <laughs> So someone on the other side would see, and because it is symmetrical, they'd see, they'd see it as a natural playing surface. Uh, okay, so the controls here are a relatively boring level and a digital input, the amount of reverb that you have, um, whether your pitch <coughs> shift the entire surface up or down. Um, this is a, an interesting con uh, concept though. This mono switch area so uh, what you can normally if you have a sound that is just a single channel just it, so I'm only going to use here's the number of voices that the DSP is using so that's the polyphony of this sound so um, uh, when you set it to one it goes into this mono mode um, which means like that that one demo that I did with the the seesaw effect where See, it's the relationship between the he's two. Not moving fingers, he's just changing pressure. Yeah, just changing the pressure between the two. It's kind of an interesting performance because you can play like this. So it's kind of like this dynamic portamento that you have that you really don't get in any other. I don't think you get it in any. I've never seen anything because it requires this. Um, you know, information between two different fingers. So um, we have this switch. And I'll just mention it now. Well, maybe I should save this for performance techniques. But anyway, you can Im if you have a polyphonic sound, um, like this one has 24 voices, um, you can set <coughs> the mono switch to a particular interval. So now um, if I play something without this mono switch on, so normally on the continuum with semitones, it's going to slide. But if I do a whole tone, I get two distinct notes. Um, so I could set the um, mono interval across the entire surface now. And but it may be a situation where you, only, you want to play poly polyphonically in a polyphonic way, but you, you also want that kind of effect, and really all you want to do is you want to get uh, uh, whole tones, let's say. Uh, that's about the range. So you can set kind of this window of um, that portamento effect. So I can play polyphonic, polyphonically. So instead of with these two fingers, which are far enough apart, It's very nice uh, performance technique. So uh, there are other mono modes that, frankly, I don't even really use. But um, there's typical things like uh, jumping between particular notes or picking the latest n new note. But you may find that uh, they're they're you good know, for you. If you want to have something that's reminiscent, say a fall on a, a sax or something. Uh, there's other mono modes. You wouldn't want portamento for that. So there's other ways to do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, well, I'll get into the matrix now since we're... Yes, since I have 24 minutes. Is it 12, 12.15 or 12? 12, 12.15. 12, okay, okay. So this is the uh, 
this is the matrix. Um, I sort of apologize on my talk from our, our visually independent friends, but this is <laughs> unfortunately a, a very visual thing at this point. No, I'll, I'll try the to. The term is light dependent and light independent. Light independent, okay. So <laughs> we are very light dependent, you know. So um, uh, this uh, is the matrix. It's this large grid. I've, I've always loved EMS synthesizers. I've always loved the matrix. I always loved the fact that those, uh, it was expensive uh, instruments, but inexpensively made in certain ways, and the whole thing was non-buffered so that pins would interact with e each other. I saw that as a plus. It probably the designer saw that as a big plus, too, I, uh, given that the oscillators would drift. And we had a Synthi 100. Um, if you don't know it, it's, a bi it's the biggest synthesizer I think EMS made. And um <coughs> uh, we never turned it off. And we only and when it was turned off and got turned, if there was a power outage, um, it took about nine hours for for the oscillators to stabilize. And by stabilize, I mean drifting only about you know twenty cents every three minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> so your compositions were tuning them up and getting them them right. But it was and um, and they would change pitch depending on where you put the pins. But one thing common with uh, all these EMS things is they had a matrix. So instead of using cables, they used patch points. And so that's what this is. Um, uh, it's, it's a matrix. It has on the left a whole series of sources that you can uh, inject into a particular pinpoint and from a row. And then in that column are a complete series of destinations. And these destinations are divided into two basic parts. This section on the left here is a master section which tends to treat things um, in with finger in interaction as a sum, the average, uh, the, the sum of, the, um, of all the um, uh, finger uh, pressure information from the fingers and then averaged, except for uh, this uh, SL and SR column, which are on a per finger basis. So you can think of this beginning part, <coughs> this is almost like the master section on your mixer. Um, and you have inputs, and any of the voices are represented here as a single point, but it actually is every single voice is, is going to be independently controllable into this mixer. So that's why you don't see like four inputs. Or it's just a stereo uh, input for all the voices. And in that section you have uh, convolution bodies, which <coughs> are short convolutions that color the sound. Um, and then we have a recirculator, which can be a reverb type or a uh, delay line, some sort of delay effect. And another convolution, um, which is post-reverb. So you have the cho choice of putting your convolution on first and then having the reverb enact, or putting reverb on the sound and convolving it so that the sound of that convolution is also reacting to the reverb. You can also have a combination of those things, that you can take that convolution and feed it um, uh, into the recircular, then feed it into another convolution. And uh, within those convolutions, you have the ability to control um, what type of response you have. We have a whole series of them built into it. The, um, uh, th this is a, a truncation control that controls how much of the convolution you're going to use, and then you can change the pitch of it. And you can set these convolution responses, you can set up four different ones and then morph in between them, uh, which is kind of interesting. It's like you, it's like you could have the you know, convolutions that represent bodies of things, like you could have the body of a violin morphing into the body of a guitar, different sizes. When I was playing that soundboard and that I got admonished for it with the pedal, um, the, that's what I was actually doing. I was changing the, which body was going through, and it creates this, this timbre sort of shape. Um, and then we have over here a whole series of, um, des these are, this is where you would see the modules that are in the uh, EGA matrix. And they're div divided into three basic groups, uh, although in each group there's some, some c kind of unique things. Um, there's these ones that have three inputs, and these can be uh, oscillators, noise, or uh, a whole series of different types of uh, 
um, filters for the most part, and a few other little specialty things. Um, and then in here, this is where you're going to find some of the more unique aspects of the uh, Egan matrix. We have these um, different types of um, banks. And w basically, we have banks based on biquad filters. So it's a whole series of these little filters that you can build up in any um, in relationships, usually harmonically, but it doesn't have to necessarily be a harmonic relationship. Um, we also have, um, so, so it's this BIC bank is short for biquad bank. Um, then we have a BIC mode, which is a little bit different because in that you can specify a graph and um, essentially draw in amplitudes and scale offsets within those and control them within the formula. It's either amplitudes or you can uh, uh, have frequency offsets as well. Um, you can go um, into uh, the big mouth, which is this thing is a series of um, um, Form and dual form and filter. I, I think there's five, uh, five um, filters that have been set up to create mouth responses. Like so, when I played that two-handed voice, that that example that you heard. In fact, I'm going to load these my group here. So the the big mouth is more like a body resonance kind of thing where you play different pitches, but unless you go out of your way to set it up that way, the uh, the form and stay at the same location where the, uh, big, the, the other ones are more uh, based in fundamental and the nth partial. Yeah, just let me get set up to do some. Since I launched into this, I realized I already prepared stuff, so. Yeah, okay. All right. So yes, we have these eight, eight banks. Um, then we have banks of, of sine waves, um, a sine bank and a sine spray. Um, th then we have here this thing called a wave bank, which is um, interesting because it's um, uh, a way of using granular technique to generate very perfect square waves, triangle waves, and um, uh, 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 sawtooth waves and and we have set up a certain number of controls for those and then these these two here these are um, last ones as Harman harmonic manipulator modman modal manipulator they're based on these um, uh, on these uh, spectral sets the, the one thing like to make that violin sound which is 150 milliseconds of Lippold's brother playing a D sharp um, there's ways of, mod of taking that data, which has saved us 12 of these spectral sets, and be able to change them into all sorts of wonderful things. And in fact, that, um, that harmonic manipulator is a direct result of um, the closed architecture of this synth. So it's like it's all encased in this single shark, so, you know, which is great because now you're in this kind of closed world where you can access things extremely quickly. The <coughs> the so-called downside of that is that you, you, you are limited to its architecture and the sort of things that it, it can do. And one of the things that it doesn't have is a lot of RAM. So when you're, say, taking, you took the sample of the false brother. Yeah. You used it to capture the spectral content of that, and that's what you put in. You, you're not actually replaying part of a sample. Well, you could call it like Lippold hates it if I say sampling. It's kind of like sampling in a sense, except that what you're dealing with is this pre-processed data, like you've windowed it so, so many times that you don't really hear it. Everything is completely phase related, so you don't hear any of the, any of the changes. So, so it's sampling in the same sense that additive sine wave synthesis is sampling. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've recorded a sample and you're uh, analyzed the data and, and messing with it. This is a different thing uh, because it's, it's implemented in time domain, but it uses 12 spectra from the original sounds. But the way it's actually implemented is, is much like we do our sawtooth waves through a granular method, which is sort of unimportant. They're, 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 they're sawtooths, and, and there's, 
the, how it's done internally is, is interesting to the shark but, and to low level programming, but they're just sawtooth waves. They don't look any different than any other sawtooth. And uh, in this case, uh, the manipulation is done uh, in time domain uh, in a very odd sort of way, but uh, in the end, uh, uh, it's 12 spectra and you have some spectral controls over each one. So, so it's basically uh, 12 periods of the attack of a single node on a viola, um, and then you use that as raw material to, to uh, manipulate different ways. So it's recent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's using some sort of original audio source as the basis for its But But it's, it's 150 milliseconds over the whole range. So at that point, you know, you could by hand write down the spectral content of those and type it in. Is that, is that really resynthesis? I don't know. Well, we don't but do it that way. Start, <laughs> you start with the sound. Yeah. Uh, but it's not recent. It's not general. It's a little bit like if you uh, uh, say you had an image of a mountain scenery and you were you did modifications to it to make it look like it was winter instead of summer or something. And now you do the exact same modifications to an image of uh, your child playing in the yard. Uh, it, it won't work. And so in that sense, it's it's really not a generic technique like that. The the, mod, uh, the modifications you do are very specific. To exactly what are the spectra and you know what, what are you messing with? It reminds me of, of wave tables, uh, like in the Waldorf synthesizers. Mm. Uh, yeah, it is, but it's very carefully. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it's always confusing. It could have been done in, in frequency domain. In fact, my first implementation was in frequency domain, and then I figured out, wait, I can do this in time domain. Yeah, and what you notice. Um, with the, in a wave table or in, or these things is things that are aperiodic uh, suffer more because you're basically when you window something like that you're really looking at these repetitive things. Yeah, for so aperiodic stuff, the the, the biquad banks are very nice because you can put your resonances anywhere you like, uh, and they can move arbitrarily during the sound. Uh, this is a much more limited technique in that way, and, and in some ways makes it easier to work with because you have fewer degrees of freedom. Yeah. Um, uh, so I will continue on with that. And then this modal manipulator, um, which is rather mysterious, but I've actually been playing around with it recently, and it's, it's, it, it's interesting. Both Lippold and I have said, well, we've s we haven't been able to seem to squeeze a lot of water out of it, but um, one thing that I've been playing around with is using it. Since it is the same spectral information, <coughs> I've been using it a lot like the you would a convolution body in terms of coloring a sound. And <coughs> excuse so me. To explain there, the Harman is a, a you explicitly uh, 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 control the spectra. In the Modman, you also do, but the synthesis, uh, there's many ways to do the synthesis. In this case, it's in, in the Modman case, the synthesis is done by bandpass filters, and they just don't, uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But in any case, they don't respond very fast. If you make quick changes to bandpass parameters, uh, it's, it's sort of unclear what the relationship between what, what you started with is and, and what you end up with. But there's a few very interesting sounds with it. Yeah. Um, to continue on, we have um, uh, different types of uh, delays, uh, audio delays, of a voice delay where you have an independent delay structure for every single voice in your sound, a sum delay which is m more useful for longer delays because it takes all the available memory for every single voice and puts it into a single container. A micro delay, um, which is the playground of Christoph, and um, this is very useful for doing a waveguide um, synthesis. Um, it very, very short delays. And a formula delay, uh, which I find a really interesting thing to uh, explore you'll see some equivalence of it in the concept of modular things as a CV recorder. So it's a, it's a control, instead of rec recording audio signal, it's been set up to rec uh, control at the, to record at the control rate, which gives you a lot more memory. And uh, there's some very interesting things you can do with that. Um, and at the very end over here, we have these shape generators uh, which we originally called LFOs and took away the name because an LFO always implies like, one of the first questions people ask, well, how far does it go into the audio range? And this is, uh, this, and the answer is, it goes there, but not in a, in a particularly pleasant way or 
<laughs> physically useful way. So we call them shape generators. Um, and there are different ways that you can re-trigger them. They basically have a frequency and a trigger. Uh, so you can make them continue a single cycle. Um, a phase from amplitude, uh, that starts to get a little bit more esoteric if you want to explore that. But if you think about <coughs> in a phase per amplitude, if, you're, if your shape was a ramp, and then you, 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 you basically, if you fed a signal into it, and the louder the signal you put into it, the farther you went into the ramp, or a ramp going down this way, let's do it that way. So you went to a ramp, and then you used a formula to control the output volume of whatever signal you were putting into and listening to it, it would act like a compressor. So that as you played softly, it was allowing more of the signal to go in, and as you played softer, uh, louder, it was attenuating the signal because of the, just the nature of the ramp. But it doesn't have to be a ramp. It could be all, all sorts of different shapes yeah, that we have. I, I think a, sh a short way to say it is it's a uh, component of an amplitude uh, uh, follower. Yeah. But it's, it, yeah, it's pretty rarely used. And over on the right, we have um, all these formulas. And that's this, this formula idea is really the basis of what makes this thing so powerful. Because instead of like in the old EMS things, you either put r pins in which pass the signal straight through or one with a slight resistor that might change the level. Um, each one of these pins is dynamic and each one of them, in, like in this particular case here, it has this mathematical formula on the bottom. So we have the sum of whatever you're doing with your x. See, we can see this times this bit here with the parentheses. So we have whatever your p finger position in X is doing, nothing with the Y direction, but also a slight change that you're doing with the Z. That gets added together and then multiplied by this number, 0.5. And gate means it's related to when your finger is down on the surface. So you can have some kind of formula like this for every single point uh, on the matrix. You can have up to <coughs> 24 or so unique formulas, <coughs> um, but you can use them as many times as you want within the matrix. Um, and it ends up being a really powerful thing. And this is the part of Kima that I essentially, you know, my, my years of doing the math in Kima is where this kind of formula idea came through. There is now, uh, just to uh, talk about Kima a little bit, uh, in, in Kima, the counterpart, for those of you who use Kima, is a hot parameter expressions. And uh, there's still uh, many things. I mean, Kima is a much more general purpose language and has much more memory and such. And uh, so there's many, many things that uh, you can do in Kima. For instance, one of my requests all the time is with, uh, I have this one vocal example uh, of a vocal phrase done out of a sine wave synthesis, uh, we could let you record your own phrase, but the manipulations on it and stuff would be limited to whatever I already have. Uh, in Kima, if you want to do that sort of thing, as it was done in the Wally -E movie and in various other places, uh, you can uh, you get Kima and you you really have the general purpose, uh, much more general purpose environment. So this is very specific. What can we do inside the shark? What subset of things? Um, are useful here uh, that we can build right into the continuum. So uh, let me just play through a, 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 diff a number of these examples that I put into my user presets at the top, and I'll just tell you basically what the um, synth synthesis technique it's being used, and you can listen to the results. So this would be classic subtractive syn synthesis where you're using oscillators and filters. Um, you know, for instance, we could trace, uh, let's say, um, uh, this uh, particular oscillator one. If, if you look at over here, see it says oscillators or filters, because these can be oscillators or filters. So in this case, it's oscillator one, which is going into a, um, this low input on this low pass filter, which has its frequency controlled by this formula here, and its bandwidth controlled by this formula, plus adding into the, this constant number one. So we have a low pass filter that's um, probably what, 18 dB, it's three of them cascaded 
together. And then the output of that uh, filter number four is going into the input of this oscillator and the audio input. And so in that case, it's acting as a wave shaper. It's actually 36 dB. But oh, 36 dB, okay, yeah. So, okay, so anyway, let me play a bit of this. <laughs> Another technique, uh, FM. Wave shaping here. It's just a very simple example to show um, oscillator one being fed into two as a wave shaper, and uh, the output of that oscillator here, and the amount of depth is controlled here. So it's controlled, this means it's a maximum of 10, but it depends on what barrel number I or letter I is going to do. Now here's an interesting side effect. If you move this barrel, you're generating a 7-bit value. So you'll probably hear some stepping if you're, if you're going to think about that performance. But you can also control it via a pedal. And what's the resolution there? 12-bit or, you know? I don't know. Better 12. And you get very smooth movements. This is an example of using that big bank, in this case extended, so there's 48 of them, and creating a uh, kind so of a plug. 48 band pedals. the uh, BIC mode, so we have this graph of amplitudes and offsets to um, create this kind of lute sound. So these are, uh, just quickly for uh those uh, that are involved in modalis. This is a much simpler setup here. Uh, those weren't exactly harmonically related, but close to harmonically related uh, resonances, just the overall resonances of the system. And then he was controlling uh, amplitudes and bandwidths uh, offsets with his fingers. This one here is that wave bank idea, a whole um, series of saw waves that have been kind of tuned off against each other. So it's kind of like this chorusing effect. And that's running into this big mouth, which creates this the, the choral um, timbre. What I do with for rounding, um, I only really use rounding in this one. If you look over here, you can see that it has a round rate. Um, any sort of sound that is ensemble for me, I, where I have a hard time hearing what the pitch center is, I'll tend to round it. And any sound that's kind of percussive, where you're going to pluck at the surface and you might not hit it exactly, I'll use initial rounding. But other than that, I tend to stay away from it. Uh, example of the sign bank. Sign spray with the bird echo.
This is the wave bank again. Um, oh wait, no, wait, here we go. Um, and it's square waves. And what I've done here is set it up so they detune the farther up on Y that you play, and they uh, tune together on the lower part so you can play choral parts. <laughs> What, what do you mean? The, the, the on-screen display, just, I don't know if it's obvious what it is. The, the, the on-screen continuum uh, showing... Oh, the yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so when you play a note, uh, you'll get this circle, which re represents uh, amplitude, or uh, how, it's Z, not amplitude, it represents Z. You'll get this, the bottom part of a line, which represents pitch. So you see as you slide, and so this actually shows you what the rounding is doing. So if I move up to here and don't change my finger, see, see how it's pulling it in? And then once I pull it enough, it grabs over there. And the triangle on the bottom and the triangle at the top are the, are the, the, um, the, the Y position. And the number is just... Is the MIDI channel or the voice number. This, this is a much old, I mean, this is our own internal MIDI, which is very similar to MPE, but, uh, but from 15 years ago. You can also uh, do MPE, the strictly the MPE standard, although you'll get uh, somewhat less resolution. This next one is, is using a spectral set. Um, in this case, it's this toy piano sound. And so I have this JMR toy piano. <laughs> And actually, that is extremely similar to what it really sounds like. And, and here, there is a little release spectral set. So as you lift up. But even just using that single spectral set and the way that we can read through it in different ways, uh, truncate it, um, it creates those um, affirmance shifts, which make it believable. It's, you don't get any sort of, well, unless you want it, you get some sort of chipmunk effect or not. Uh, this is using the um, uh, Modman and a pizzicata from a uh, viola, like a snap pizzicata, to create something that's kind of like a koto, but. Okay, yeah, so this is a sound using the, a voice delay. And in this case, I extended the time of the voice delay, which makes it a little bit duller um, as a byproduct of gaining more memory space. Uh, it, it worked well with this sound, so I didn't, didn't mind that effect at all. This one is using a sum delay. Um, is one that's using this formula delay um, and this is it, it's just very interesting what happens when you take sort of your performance 
data and then pull it apart and reintroduce it into um, the, uh, the oscillators. And this is a sound um, that Christoph worked on. It's pretty interesting. This is the waveguide stuff. You can see he's using the micro delay, but he's set it up that it puts energy back into the system by stroking it. You can either play like this or... So that's a variety of the synthesis techniques that we have in here, but uh, yeah, so any questions? Anything? Why, why did you not put sine waves in the way in the way Um uh, well they're easily available. Oh, I so guess, so yeah. I guess it's possible that we ch chose that, but uh but that way you could have ten of them since you can have five in each bank and you could do nice uh, like added things on ten different sine waves. We yeah we are we I guess we already have a sign bank. Yeah, but that, that's yeah. controlled much in a more holistic way than, than right. Yeah, yeah, to have each one individually yeah. useful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just because I well probably because I never desired it. <laughs> 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 See that, that that's what I'm saying. I'm lucky I, I have to be in a relationship like this with Lippold is that I essentially have this you know, uh, this brilliant mind that I can exploit and uh, someone who actually listens to ideas that I... I actually <laughs> spent uh, my early decades uh, definitely... Con you need to recalibrate for me. Um, hmm? But uh, uh, I spent my uh, early days, uh, or my, my early years, my first decades uh, working at Adam's Fangway Synthesis, uh, completely convinced that that was, you know, like sampling, except so much more... Uh, Manipulable that uh, it was the thing of the future, and it wasn't really until I met Ed that I figured out well, these other things are, especially in a timbre feedback loop with a performer, are extremely useful. And and just the uh, the limitations of all these synthesis techniques that have much fewer parameters. For instance, the biquad banks were compared to added sine wave synthesis, it's many orders of magnitude less data to control, uh, have the advantage that well. It's many less, many orders of uh, magnitude less data to control. So, so uh, part of the thing here is that, uh, like that modeling phrase that uh, we have in there, uh, is the, one of the first things I made for on the shark just to learn how to program it. But we really didn't do that much more than with uh, with additive sine wave synthesis uh, after that. I don't think uh, of traditional sort of additive yeah. sine wave synthesis where you control amplitude, frequency, and in, in our case also noise bandwidth. At the same time, you know, after he had developed that, we started to explore these other synthes synthesis techniques that we were getting pretty excited about, you know, like with the spectral set, so. It's very hard, and, you know, just in the additive synthesis, set, a lot of the problem is, well, you want a breathier sound, or you want this or that. It is very hard to, to actually make it breathier yes, uh, in a convincing yeah. way. It's not, it, it's, not, uh, and it's not so easily manipulable as I thought it was. Uh, before I met somebody who really performs and uh, uh, really is changing the timbre in real time. Yeah, Russell? Um, in the, uh, the toy piano example, how, how do you implement the, that, that release? Um, uh, let me find that one. I can tell you're an E matrix person. Yeah, release <laughs> here. <laughs> And let me see what I did here. Yeah. Huh? Release said. Ah. Okay. There's another way you can do it too, is by triggering the um, shape generator to read when your finger goes. 
So you sort of just reverse it. Okay. But this, but by doing it this method, see if I release slowly, so now I have control over that. It's like a release velocity. Mm -hmm. Can't you hear it if you release mm -hmm. fast? And if I release slow, you don't hear it. Yeah. It, but only in the um, it, I th it's a windowed function, so it's like a sample and hold. So it's looking at, at just the same way key velocities go. You look at a little window of time and say, okay, I sort of figure out where this is. If I go fast, well, it's, it's actually it's so fast computated. This thing is this little numeric display over here is not not very useful for telling you what that value is because yeah. it just can't can't keep up. This little, this is a little helper that gives you a, a number value that when you're trying to figure out, well, exactly what is this formula out, sending out. Uh, it's also important to remember to turn this off because the way it's currently implemented, uh, if you have that on, it will take away your polyphony um, if you have an expanded system. So like in this system, on a normal uh, unexpanded continuum it would be six voice but because I have the um, extra processors it's it's allocating more voices to it and it ends up being 24 voices if you look in the upper right hand corner you always get a it's even more complicated than that if you have a one of the n newer continuums from the last few years uh, it has a 2x processor so at that point it'd be eight voices um, if you have an original product the, the number you see there is yeah. for the uh, for the 1x processor. So it, it's complicated to figure out. That's why in blue it shows you the actual polyphony because it's too hard to figure out. Uh, it's such a combination of things. But the other reason to turn these things off is this is all MIDI that uh, communications and you don't want to waste your MIDI bandwidth with things that you're not even looking at. The continuum in a normal case will use 100% of the MIDI bandwidth. And if you uh, stuff other things in there, you're just going to get lower resolution um, out of the continuum, L lower time resolution. Yeah, it's all that sort of setup is a testament of the backwards compatibility of uh, what we would call an uh, L1X, which had that single processor, all the way up to an L6X. L means light action, um, six times processor. So, yeah, it's complicated by the fact that that six times the processing power but there's also memory and there's various yeah. other things, uh, you know, it, it's sort of a simplified. Uh, if your processor and power are limited, which is usually what people care about, then, then the 6x matters. And when do you get processing power limited? Well, it depends what you hook up in the matrix. But uh, there's certainly some things that are more expensive than others in the matrix, uh, processor-wise. So there's some sounds that you, on, a, on the original processor, you'll only get a polyphony of three, and that's why we went to the double speed processor, so you'd get six. But because of memory limitations, no single processor can ever do more than eight. So it's a very complicated uh, thing. I, I have a, this full size plus an expander. So I have an L6X. I also have a half size on purpose that's an L1X. So I check them out like, to see, am I getting too far ahead? What you'll find is that this additional uh, um, polyphony is, is useful for sounds that sustain over time. Any other questions? Yeah? I want to see an example of your usage of the convolution um, bodies that you have at the bottom of the home page of the matrix. Um, yeah, well, let me go to. I think this one, yeah. Okay, so you see here, this is the index of the convolution. In other words, where it's going to read within these convolution values from the guitar to the water phone to the snap to the fiber. All these convolutions are at their default maximum length and they are all at their standard tuning. And I put that control under this pedal and labeled it body like this. So now if when I'm doing that I'm actually moving 
the data where it's reading through this smoothly through this convolution. So, like SNAP and Fiber have less low frequency information. And as I move through the water foam body and the dark and the guitar. Yes. Yeah. That's way back. Yeah. Yeah. So in that, I don't know if it was clear that Formula G, you uh, in the thumbnails, you can see that it uses pedal four. And uh, yeah. Yeah. There or it is. Pedal three. I'm sorry. Uh, no. I'm sorry. How, how does that explain? Three. That? It's the body. Okay. So yes. Pedal three yeah. is the body, and that's used in Formula G, which is at that patch point in the matrix. Yeah. And then I think what did I do here? Shape generator. I, uh, you know, I, I forget what I did, <laughs> frankly. There's just so many things to remember. Yeah, so these, this one, number two, controls the speed of a, um, of a uh, shape generator, which is running through this notch filter. So that creates that. changing the, the speed of that modulating notch filter and the body shape. Get some interesting tonal shapes too. All from this voice delay, which is this quick feedback network. You know, the, the key is... is um, getting that to ring. Thanks. Thank you.